Okay, I think we can get started here. Um, I am Pat Polingo, the marketing director at Yale Appliance. I have uh, with me today our owner, Steve Scheinkoff, and a couple panelists from our team who are going to jump in and help with the Q&A. Our topic today is kitchen appliances you should never buy. An important topic we, uh, we started talking about recently. Um, I know Steve's very uh, excited about this topic, ready to share. Just want to get to a few housekeeping items. Um, we are recording today, so we will be able to share this presentation afterwards. Um, so keep that in mind as you scribble down notes. We're gonna, you'll have the whole recording to work from. Um, we also have all of our previous webinars available on our YouTube channel. So feel free to check that out um, if you'd like to find other topics we've covered. Um, and so uh, we'll, we will share this presentation uh, by the end of the week for sure. So just be on the lookout for that. And um, we're using the Q&A today. So feel free to use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send over questions as they pop in. We'll, we'll start by um, jumping into the questions that were submitted during the registration. And with that out of the way, I'll turn it over to Steve to talk about kitchen appliances you should never buy. Thank you, Pat. Thank you everyone for spending your Wednesday at 11 o'clock with us. This topic is exciting because I'm excited when you tell me uh, you didn't buy that. Uh, and I'm gonna give you right, I'm gonna give you some reasons why, but I wanna put it, this all in a historical context. Of what happens when you buy an appliance you shouldn't buy? And um, there's three varying issues. I'm gonna go one by one. I think, I think you'll find this kind of fun. First one, the history of appliances. This one actually wrecked a great company, uh, Baytag. I don't know if any of you remember the Maytag Neptune washer. Maytag Neptune was the original front load. At a time when people were spending $400, this sold for $9.99. It was probably the single biggest introduction I've ever seen. They actually introduced this on Broadway. Energy efficient, water efficient, all the makings of good front loadings with one problem. Problem was the inner tub and the outer tub, there was a gap. And so water could get into that gap and you couldn't clean the water out. Now, what happens with standing water is it creates mold and mildew. And over time, um, the product couldn't be fixed. It actually wrecked the company. They were sold, for, sold to Whirlpool shortly thereafter. What it means to you, a problem, a product problem like this means replace the washer. It costs you either the $500 to go to the top load or a thousand for a front load. Here's the next level. A friend of mine was down in Texas I said, do you ever sell a Decor 30 inch dishwasher? I said, no, Decor had no history of selling dishwashers in 30 inches in a typical size. Dishwashers, you know, are 18 or 24 inches. He goes, well, I bought one and it leaked. I go, yeah, it, 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 was, it was problems from day one. So he had to replace it only, he had to replace the whole cabinet because it was 30 inch, there wasn't another dishwasher to go in there. So replacing the cabinet, replacing dishwashers, 3,000 to 10,000. And one of the things that I want to impress upon you is stay away from proprietary dimensions and products if you can, because if they don't work out or if you need to replace them in six to 10 years, it, it's, it's really a hard time. And then you have to start readdressing everything that goes around it. But for him, three to 10,000, we could probably build wood around it would have been just fine. I'm going to talk about a, a real problem. And we've talked about this one before. And this still goes on. In fact, it's more popular now than ever. Downdrafting a pro range or downdrafting period. And I can't believe this is still a popular photo. And I, I can't believe I'm still saying that after all these webinars. But what this means to you is, is um, four things. Either after, and this is after the fact, most of these we're going to talk about new construction. After the fact, putting in an overhead hood is hard because you've got to duct it to the outside. So that's really hard if it can be done and really expensive. You always have the option of not using the range or remodeling the new kitchen or moving and make it the next person's problem. Um, four webinars ago, I talked about uh, an island without ventilation and no ability to vent and how everything was interconnected and you have to replace the whole kitchen. It's still in the market in Boston. Now, how much does this cost? Well, it depends on the cabinets, whether you get the contractor, the electrician, plumber back probably 30 to 60,000 depending. So with that in mind, I 
want to give you the 11 kitchen appliances you should never buy for new construction. They go from mild to really painful. We're going to talk about the Samsung Family Hub counter depth refrigerator. We're going to talk about extraordinarily quiet dishwashers, oversized washers, the Samsung slide in uh, flex duo, 30 inch dual fuels. You've been led to believe that's the best possible option, and it's not. Appliances with air frying, anything you won't use. Uh, I've got a personal example for that one. Black stainless, which I can't believe is still being sold. Uh, combo washers and dryers, and why it's such a huge issue. And then, you know, my, my favorite two, outdoor grills placed in indoors and down wraps. We're gonna go over that again. I know we've gone over that a lot in other webinars, but that's really where you can go wrong in an introduction, in, in, a, in a construction. And then on questions, we're gonna talk about how to buy appliances. Uh, I have Dennis, our director of sales, that'll help me with that. So without further ado, let's talk about some of the past webinars. Construction is divided into four equal parts. This is selection. We're now, we've, all, we've designed and we scheduled like some of the things, how to start and some of the outdoor things we've done. This is where we're gonna start choosing. With that in mind, let's, took it, let's take a look at a product that's on display in our showroom. Samsung Family Hub Counter Depth Refrigerator. I actually think this has got a lot of good usage, especially if you've got ring, you can run the ring right to your uh, refrigerator. So every time someone hits a button or maybe breaches your perimeter, it'll show in your refrigerator. It's great. You know, it's billed as, you know, you have cameras inside the refrigerator. So on its smart application, you can look inside to make sure you don't have that extra bottle of Dijon mustard. Here are the problems is you've got more functionality in your cell phone, which you all, which we all use. And who fixes this? Is it computer? When that tablet goes, is it a refrigerator repairman or a technician? You know, our guys kind of do both, but in certain areas, that's a, a very big concern. The other concern, when we talk about, and we're gonna go, I'm gonna go into smart, maybe go a little over the, um, um, the most, the things you shouldn't buy, but isn't refrigerator supposed to keep food fresher? And there's a lot of companies that are starting to address this in an organic way. Sub-Zero was first with their ethylene scrubber and uh, you know, their, their uh, magnetic, their vacuum seed, sealed door, magnetic crispers, all to keep food fresher uh, for a longer period of time. Well, Bosch does that now with two compressors, same as Sub-Zero. They've got the stainless back, stainless absorbs cold better. The one that I kind of think is really um, interesting is Beko, blue lighting. It, it doesn't mean a lot to other people. We used to be in the lighting business, and as it turns, Blue is the Kelvin temperature that sun of, of sunlight, 5,000 K. When you put blue lighting in a refrigerator, it's supposed to extend the life of photosynthesis to keep your food fresher for a long period of time. Like Sub-Zero, they have the ethylene filter. Ethylene gases um, are emitted off spoiling foods. If you filter that, it slows down that process and eliminates cross-contamination of the foods. Ion chargers, it turns out odors have a positive charge. Beko sends out a negative charge, so your so your refrigerator uh, smells fresher. We actually test this because a lot of the sounds kind of crazy. We did a project produce, which was a four week kind of still photo of what these things look like in five different refrigerator. Beko actually was number two after Sub Zero. So that's one of the other things. You know, it's cute to look inside your refrigerator. It's better if your vegetables last longer. And this goes into that whole smart because we're kind of like at a a crossroads. Five years from now, everything's going to be smart and way more functional. We talked about that in a couple of webinars ago. But I imagine for people in the webinar, two different two different classes, the designers that want to know what's coming and homeowners that want to know what's now because you're ready to place your order. Well, here's what smart's going to do for you now. Jen Air was a, a pioneer. You can turn the range on or off remotely, adjust temperature remotely. Um, you have access to recipes you can get on their app. Interesting, but meal is not smart, but you have a hundred pre-programmed recipes that are right in that range. It's got steam assist functionality. So if you want to bake bread, you can do it automatically, but if you want California sourdough, there's a button that says California sourdough, you hit the button, you make our California sourdough bread. It's got the master chef control. We enter the food, how you want it cooked, and the range figures out time and temperature, which one is better. So I think when we talk about smart, we talk about different things that we may or may not want to buy. We talk about the functions we can use right now if you're a homeowner. And it's, it's what I've come up with is kind of like a hybrid. Probably the best introduction in a long time is this um, LG wash tower. 
right? It's got all the cool features. It texts you when the washer's done to so stand in front of it. It's got a one, top, one touch op, uh, operation. It's customizable. So if you have a program, you can hit the button and, and, and it's customized the way you want to do things, right? It's got the AIDD. Artificial intelligence is really a, a cute word for saying predictive analysis, right? Using sensors. But really what makes this thing cool is it's shallow and it's got controls in the middle. When you stack a washer, a dryer on the washer, if you're below five foot seven, you have to reach for the controls kind of convenient. So they've really implemented kind of like usable features with usable smart. And that's kind of the way you got to buy it. You know, we talk about buying appliance, we'll talk about that afterwards. What are the features you use and what are the features uh, that are available? So kind of a segue into extraordinarily quiet dishwasher. You only need 44 decibels. We've We've had a, a sound meter in all of them. You can't hear under 44 dBs, right? And you're paying more money for anything quieter. Uh, and it's not really worth it as a feature, say. I'll give you an illustration. Let's talk about a Bosch benchmark for the 100 series. For five decibels, you're paying $1,000. You're getting some functionality as well, but it's a lot of money to spend for quiet. That said, um, and, and, and meal is a lot like that. Um, and there is some, some functionality, Samsung, LG, all of them are kind of like that. You pay more for quietness. Under 44 decibels, it shouldn't be a feature. There are other things, you know, Bosch has got zeolite drying and a whole bunch of other features. But here's a little hack. There are two companies that actually will give you a 39 decibel if you want them. One of them, you can put a panel on, it's under $1,000. KitchenAid in the 200 series, Beko has this panelized and unpanelized 39 decibels. But for everything else, 44 is fine. Let's talk about oversized washer and dryers. If you live in Boston, you're probably not gonna fit them anyway. But what an oversized washer is, and we've got here the Samsung Flex um, with two-in-one washer, and then you've got the Mega LG with $16.99. Really, what you're getting is 5.8 cubic feet. Now a base GE with the antimicrobial is 4.8 cubic foot, it's $9.99. So for $700, you're getting one cubic feet. It's not a lot. And the other thing when you got to worry about oversize anything, if you live in cities or in urban environments, how are you going to fit it? And if you've got existing laundry rooms, how are you going to fit it? Because these are 35, 36 inches deep. So really, um, our parents worked off 2.5 cubic foot usable when you take the, agit take the agitator out of the top load. You will do just fine at 4.5, where LG is, and they've got the shallow ones, where G is 4.8 to 5. That's really it. Once you go up way up high, you're spending almost $1,000 for really not a lot. So that's one you should probably stay away from. The Samsung, I love this range. I loved it when I saw it until I read the instruction manual. This is a flex duo. This is two ovens where you take out what's called the smart divider to make it one oven. So you can choose one or two. Nice idea. So with a heat source in one area, if you look on pages 36 and 37 of the, um, of the guide, there's a lot of temperatures that don't work. Like if you wanna do 350, 350, you can't do it in that oven, right? Um, so it's one to stay away from with that in mind. It's got a lot of other decent features. But if you want really a double oven, right? You go with a, a double oven, which is the GE has it. I think there's other brands that do, or a KitchenAid has one, or you get, um, the big oven that KitchenAid has in their, in their front control with a baking drawer below where you can just bake bread or whatever you want in the drawer. But the Samsung with the smart divider is too limited in terms of temperature range to really truly be effective. It's heavily marketed, put air frying in it. We'll get to that one pretty soon too. I love this. If you go to an appliance store and you say, what's the best range? They're gonna point you to a dual fuel range. And in 36, 48, 60, that's another consideration because a lot of manufacturers put different features on it. But if they say this is the best, it's not, right? If you, and one of the things we talk about is what features do you like? If you like to roast or broil, electric is a very dry heat. Um, it'll do it, but not as well. And is it the fastest? Well, it's neither of those two. You shouldn't be buying a dual fuel. Nobody should be buying a 30 inch dual fuel range because induction is electric. It's magnetic, it's faster than gas with an infinite simmer, right? Because you can only get gas, you only get gas down before it just blows out. 
even the thermal extra low is 100 BTUs and it turns on and off, right? It's child safer. I use that word safer, it's not child proof because the glasses get hot. The way induction work is the magnets in the, um, and I know there's somebody that asked a question about cooktops. Cooktops are reliable, by the way. Uh, magnets use the pan that uh, excites the molecules of the steel in the pan, pan cooks the food, bypasses the glass. So the glass only gets warm, so it doesn't bake anything in. Even on that gas hob, when, you, when, when stuff gets on that gas hob, it's hard to get off because it's baked on by heat. You don't have that in induction. So it's easier to clean, way easier vent. You start to see pro ranges um, with induction modules to get past the whole venting requirements. So instead of dual fuel, consider induction. Or if you want, if you like to roast or broil, go gas, right? You don't have the electric load uh, for a lot of people in harbor towers and everything. Gas only uses regular amperage. But I, I put out, I, I put out the meal up uh, gas pro and any gas will do. The meal has got an infrared broiler. Infrared is a direct source heat. You see a lot of broilers that look like tubes. Those are regular broilers. They spread the heat out. An infrared focuses the heat down. Meal has got a lot of the pros um, have infrared. So the infrared is direct heat. It's great to boil. And I use this one because it's the same exact infrared sear element as a Lynx grill. So a lot of people are spending $8,000 on these Lynx sear elements. They can buy it just in a, in, a, in, a, in a pro range and put it in their house and have it all year round. At least in Massachusetts all year round. Okay. So gas, induction, certainly over dual fuel. Air frying. This is uh, really disappointing. Um, and Saba can talk to this because we she performed the experiments on it. Air frying and appliances don't work because you need airflow and you need heat, right? So most of these ovens are five cubic feet. So you can't get the heat flow to air fry or crisp as they all say. And I, I know what the videos say on their, on, their, on their sides, but we tried to do it. You cannot air fry. That's why when you look at air fryers, they're all tabletop, right? These are all small because the heat can be intense in a smaller kind of area. So if you're buying for air fry, don't. The good news is every other functional work, right? Anything you won't use. And this goes like dead set against all some of my other webinars. Um, and I have two interesting stories. My mom, when we moved out of Needham into Jamaica Plain when we all went off to college, you know, she got, she got her dream kitchen with the, at that time, the Gen Air downdraft range, if you believe it, uh, sharp convection microwave top, which was very advanced at that time, sub-zero refrigerator, and then she had to have her chambers single wall, and chambers was bought up by KitchenAid shortly thereafter. When she left, the factory packing was still in the chambers of it. So not to slander my mom as I, I've done the last two webinars. I'm sorry, mom. You know, you look at my kitchen right there, and I love steam ovens. We learned, you know, uh, I, I got to know steam by watching um, Sub's video. My, my girlfriend's a huge cook. Won't use it because she's got her own way of cooking rice. So one of the things is you're picking out the newest, latest, and greatest. Make sure it's something you'll use. And, and a lot of this can be very intimidating. So, you know, the, the whole solution is to learn how to use it. And, and that mind gave me an idea that, you know, I can cook too, and I have in the past on the grill and everything else, but I can learn how to use to cook steam. So we're going to have some basic steam classes and steam convection classes. So you can become more, you know, I think if you begin and you learn how to use it, get some confidence, then you can do the more advanced stuff. So that's something we're going to be rolling out the next couple months is just basic stuff. But again, you know, steam is something, it's not cooking in radiance. You got to learn how to use it as you will convection, as you will, um, you know, speed, which is a combination of uh, convection and microwave. So I can't believe this is still, this is still in vogue. Black stainless steel. I'm not talking about black. And I was gonna like put this aside saying no one was buying this anymore. And at one time, 35% of all packages sold were black stainless steel. So um, uh, we did a test on it. And as it turns out, black stainless steel is, is an oxide coating, except for Bosch. Um, it's an oxide coating that is breachable. 
So I did a fork test on it. And I think it's up to 82,000 views of how easy it is to breach. And once you breach it, it's a cosmetic issue um, and it's unrepairable. So I was thinking about novel solutions to people that may be on this call that are saddled with black stainless and have like a day or two to spend is maybe just peeling the black stainless off because underneath that black stainless is stainless steel. I think you may need a hairdryer, a few other things. And if anyone's interested in doing that, I'll, we'll have to do a little more research on it. But really, black stainless is something to just avoid just because it, it looks good, but it's unrepairable after the fact and so easy to scratch. So here's some alternatives. It's just stainless steel. Whether we like it or not, stainless matches every um, cabinet style is the most hygienic, which is why restaurants use it. And it's the easiest to keep technically clean. We have stainless steel cleaner. You don't need, you know, the purine, poisonous kind. You get the ones with orange in it. Very simple to clean, okay? But if you're sick of stainless steel, you know, you can do adding a pop of color. You know, we like orange here for some reason. Um, and you, there are a number of different companies that, are, that, that will give you really nice colors um, and a lot of different brands, not a lot, of, not, not very expensive. That will give you a good alternative to uh, black stainless steel. And then, you know, there's new companies out. There's one company that will actually allow you to personalize it. I wouldn't personalize it to the Jets thing as a New England fan, but, you know, you could take a picture like, you know, my kid on a good day or, or, or Patriots when they get licensed and um, put that as your front. You also have uh, companies like La Cornu, Blue Star, um, Viking of a certain standpoint that allow you a number of different colors, a number of different finishes, I know uh, La Cornu and Blue Star will allow you to pick your own paint color, send it, and they'll send it back to you as a chip. And you can have your own unique color and trim. So there are alternatives to black stainless steel. Okay, combo washers and dryers don't work. And it, this is so discouraging. You know, uh, a few years ago, 10 years ago, an Apple engineer said he's gonna figure it out. Uh, that didn't happen. And there's a lot of new stuff that's, that's, that's come out that had real potential and we've had it tested. And here's the problem, on the wash cycle, it can't remove the lint effectively. So what happens is that lint just builds up in your machine until it seizes the motor and you need to buy another one. And here's why this is number three, because a lot of people, especially in smaller spaces, are building this in to their kitchens or in this case, into their laundry room. And what do you do now? Okay, you've got to replace this unnamed, well, it's, there's two companies that really do it, LG and Whirlpool, um, washer, and you either, you have to keep replacing it every two to three years. Um, and that can be kind of expensive. So really the option is before you get started with something like that is to, um, it's just to get a, 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 a washer and a dryer, it'll work better. And when you buy a, a, a compact, say, and that would fit in that, if we look at that closet again, this will fit in that. You won't get the, the nice towels on it, you'll put the towels somewhere, but this will work. And the way you, you buy compact laundry is through the dryer. Dryers you can buy, whereas in a normal suburban, you know, you buy vented, you have the vented hose and, and it goes out. But um, on, on ventless, it comes back in. And there are two types, there's, there's heat pump that uses a compressor, it doesn't emit, emit heat out, much more energy efficient. You're seeing a lot of those in Europe. Neil is an early adopter, Bosch has got a really good 220 volt one now. Samsung should be introducing theirs. Beko that I mentioned has got a really good one, kind of inexpensive. And then you've got the con condenser types, which use regular heat. Those emit heat back into the room. So um, wash your hand dry. Don't, don't do a combo and don't build in the combo because you're gonna be replacing it every couple of years, especially if you use it. I think people should be familiar with this, putting a grill on the outside, who will do that? And I always say during these, your three season porch. This is obviously a new picture because I assure you those, those, um, those pillows will not be orange for long. 69,000 BTUs of heat. Um, and we're gonna get into venting in one way um, of smoke, especially you know, the grease that, that is emitted from a grill really can't be vented properly. Um, if it is, you almost need a commercial style vent, a minimum 1500 CFM. Which goes me to number one, we're gonna talk a lot about venting because that's the real 
mistake you're going to make, you know, whether you buy induction or regular, or even, um, you know, the, the product will still cook. This is the, the kind of game changer that you may need to remodel. And number one to me, and again, some people do it in existing, I get it, it's better than nothing. But in new construction, there's no place for downdraft. Downdrafts have no capture area, they reduce the static flow, um, you know, smoke goes up, this is going down, you got an elbow which reduces uh, pressure, it's long ducting runs. Everything about venting works backwards with the downdraft. If you're planning a new kitchen, there's no place for this. You can do better. Uh, put it up against a wall, vent straight up and straight back. Now, let me explain how you vent, uh, because this is always questions that come up. And again, if you think this is just for pro ranges, I want to remind you that the basic Whirlpool pro range, the basic Whirlpool range now is 49,000 BTUs, up from 30,000 when I started, with two 15,000 BTU burners on the front. That's pro style burners, or what was at one time. And again, the four crucial elements of ventilation are CFM, capture, venting direction, and duct size. I'll go over each briefly. I know this is a review for some of you. CFM is, is basically cubic foot per minute. So if we talk about a professional hood like this, 1200 CFM, that's 1200 cubes of air exhausted per minute or the equivalent of a small room per minute out of your house. And we'll get to the problem with that in a second of having a small room of air leaving your house every minute. What people get wrong is, is capture, is even if you buy 2000 CFM, which we you can't buy residentially, if you don't have enough hood capture, which means um, uh, if we look at a pro range, typically it'll be 24 to 27 inches deep, at least the minimum width size, and about 18 inches deep. Smoke is, when you smoke up a lot of stuff, it's, it's housed and then evacuated out of your house, and you need that kind of capture. Without it, downdrafts are a perfect example. Smoke will never get uh, captured and then going out of your house. Direction, a lot of people will say to me, is it okay if? And the answer to that question is probably no, if, if people ask that question. You know, if you're putting more than one elbow in, it won't work. If you're going too long, it probably won't work. So really, straight up, straight back. You smoke, gravity goes up, that's where you should vent, okay? Multiple elbows won't work, even if you use a booster. Okay, duck size, as I show you once again, kind of a trick question, event with no with absolutely no capture area, right? Use the recommended duck size, right? Not the flexible ducting that some people use. You know, six, eight, 10, larger duct is, is good because you're always gonna transition. And that's how you vent, right? Here are the products to avoid. Downdrafts we mentioned, over the range microwaves which I happen to love, especially in smaller kitchens. The reality of the range micro, it's only 15 inches deep, 310 CFM. We take that Whirlpool range or even the G that we show is the power burners are always in the front and it's not gonna capture it. Now, I like over the range microwaves for two reasons. It centralizes cooking and basically it's a throwaway in a package. So really, if you need one, if you're gonna have one, again, I think you should put a hood and there's all kinds of places to put microwaves. Um, over the range microwaves, you can probably have to cook in the back burners. But really, we think getting a hood and putting the vent in, and putting microwave either in a drawer, building it with a trim kit, or build it in under a cabinet. You know, the G Gem does, uh, Gem series does a nice job of that. Right. So, we talked about uh, CFM. Um, I want to talk about makeup air. A lot of people are from the West Coast here, and you probably don't have makeup laws. Um, in mass, anything over 400 CFM needs a fresh air return, period. You're not gonna get a, a, a CO without it, okay? But without makeup air, even if you, even if you get around it, your indoor air quality will suffer. And there's new studies that show that the, the air pollution that we're breathing and that we have problems with are inside our house, not outside. As I sit here next to the expressway, inside your homes are worse. And they mentioned cooking before smoking a cigarette as I mentioned before. Now we have terms for it too. We have IAP, which is internal air pollution. We have SBS, sick building syndrome, IAQ, internal air pollution. It's all linked to poor ventilation. And a lot of times, if, you, if your house smells like what you last cooked, that's a problem. And again, fixing this with ventilation is only a couple hundred bucks from the get-go. 
of, of buying a better hood and a better blower. It's not much in the scheme of things. And well worth your investment and way less expensive than doing it over again, which a lot of people have to do. But remember, you know, we, we talk about different conditions and asthma, childhood and asthma. I, I really think a lot of this can be traced back to the fact that we're either not turning on our vents and we're putting highly combustible gas, gas stoves in there uh, or we're not venting properly. Not a scare tactic, but it's simple to do and there's no reason not to get it done. This is, um, this is make up air in a, um, in a diagram. Air goes in, air, air goes out, air comes in. New construction, it's simple. Every contractor should know how to do this. Put it through the HVAC system. For older homes, it's 10 feet away. And it must be on the opposite wall. So you're not getting in the, the stuff that you're, you're going out. So you're getting a fresh air every time the air goes out, right? And that's make up air. And that's why it's so important. And that's why, you know, if you're on this call right now and you're just starting, ramp up your vent. It doesn't cost much. And, and, and I really think it'll pay dividends to the, to, the, to the air quality of your house. Not to say like the grease that'll get over your cabinets or everything else, if you like to cook. Once again, I end this the same way almost every time. It's, what's amazing to me is that we buy the newest and greatest and we don't ask the fundamental question of who's gonna fix it. Because the manufacturers don't. And here's a graphic that says they don't. Which is why service is two thirds of the company's composition, although we're known for showrooms. Whatever you buy, and again, I'm, I'm totally brand indifferent in a lot of ways that I'll give the edge. You know, when you're talking about Wolf, Mila, Thermidor, all great products, they all have their strengths and minuses. But I almost give the edge to, to the one that actually can fix it in your area. And again, there's a lot of people in New York and California. That has to be a fundamental question of who's going who's gonna to deliver it? Who's going to stop it? Who's going to fix it? Because they're not doing it in Boston and chances are they're not doing it anywhere else. So you have to find either a self-servicing dealer and those can be good or bad or a factory. And the way you do that is you look at Google and you look at Google. So if I was to sum up what I said today, many of these problems are annoying and manageable. You know, when we talk about air fry, it's not a tragedy because the rest of the oven that you've known and love will work. Be critical when you're buying smart right now because you're buying a smart appliance, but it may not have the features, better features that you could use right now. Don't design in unique products. You know, as I say that, my cousin's got two 27 inch sub zeros in his house. They made that in, in 10 years. That could be a problem in a few years. Choosing the wrong cooking appliance and ventilation is your biggest problem. Plan those well. Remember specifying the right appliances it means you're halfway there. Vent your store, vent your service. And with that, I will say thank you. The next webinar, uh, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, we, we, we're known for the what not to do. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about unique appliances that should be in your home. And I'm even going to give you one right now to get you interested because the negative stuff, always people are more into that than actually the unique stuff. I guess you don't want to, you don't want to do the wrong thing, but here's one you should do. If you're planning a new kitchen, you should absolutely buy a water purifier. Not because it's the right thing to do for the environment, which it is, it's because moving that stuff in and out, especially, you know, I used to be on a fifth floor walk. I'm going, why am I, why am I doing this? The cost of, I just, I just got a, a recharge of my uh, water filter, 6,000 gallons, 129 bucks. And it removes like everything I need from lead to cysts to giardia to viruses. How much does 6,000 gallons of, of that water cost you right now? It's easy to do. You tap it right in. I'm going to turn it today. When I replace it, I'm going to turn it, put it back in. And that's one of the things you could do that, uh, for your kitchen that you should absolutely do. So with that in mind, we have no idea when the next one will be, uh, but we know it'll be at 11 o'clock. So with that in mind, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dennis McDonald, who's gonna help you uh, buy appliances. Um, it's always entertaining with me and Dennis because we have totally different point of views and he's, he's not always wrong. Um, we have Manny, who's, um, who put the PowerPoint together. He does all the training to make sure that everybody at Yale is consistent. And of course, uh, Pat, who you know, is really the face of Yale marketing. And um, Pat just put together a series of um, Appliance 101, which is just the basics of how to get through cooking, ventilation, dishwashers, venting, things not to do, center warranties. 
it's on YouTube, it's gotten a lot of hits. If you're new, you may want to uh, look at that. And last but not least, one who has to use all this stuff, Saba. Actually, um, she knows all about air frying. She's a sous vide specialist, uh, precision boiling in a bag. Actually the grand champion, charm crowned by her new best friend, Martha Stewart. And as I said before, she tested and is not a current fan of air frying. So with that, I'll leave it to your questions. And thank you again for attending um, appliances you shouldn't buy. Great, thank you, Steve. Yeah, we'll transition to the Q&A section now. We got a lot of great questions during the registration. Uh, continue to use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, I see questions are coming in already. Let's, uh, let's just dive in. So one question that we got during registration, uh, this is an important question right now. Um, should I buy a group of appliances, a uh, grouping of appliances or buy them individually? Um, Dennis, do you wanna take a stab at that one? Yeah, so that kind of leads in what Steve says to how to buy appliances during COVID. I, I would say pre and post COVID, let's assume stuff's in stock. Um, sure, people buy suites. Uh, we try to educate you uh, where the suites make sense. Understand it's marketing, trying to get attachment within their brands. And in some cases you end up following suites of products, chasing a rebate all the while there could have been better value along the way with some products that quite frankly may work a bit better. Um, Case in point, you know, a, a suite of brands that maybe a Bosch dishwasher or a Beko dishwasher is better value than, than, than the manufacturer itself trying to sell you this all in one suite, and therefore you save as much, if not more, money than the rebate. That's one. In the highest end kitchens, we do, frankly, um, it's probably more of a mix. You know, you might see someone do a meal a dishwasher uh, with a sub zero fridge and a, maybe thermal door ovens. I mean, they mix in and out. Um, Frankly, there, you're just trying to make sure that aesthetically things balance. You know, we get the question, does stainless match? And 99% of the time, the answer to that is yes. You probably haven't walked in many kitchens, seen mixed appliances, and the highest end ones do have mixed appliances more often, and nothing jumps out at you as out of, out of whack. Just trying to keep the har harmony with the handles and things like that to make sure that those balance well. Um, and, but today now, more, more than ever, in COVID, we spend probably the first 10 or 15 minutes of, of meeting a customer kind of taking angst away from when do they buy and how do they buy and is it going to be available? And really what we would recommend is, is a couple things. When you're searching for an appliance store, first off, are they commissioned? Are the salespeople just absolutely commissioned to sell you what they want to sell you, not necessarily what you should want and makes the most sense for you? So that should be a real question to ask. Um, beyond that, um, the next thing would be to really take a list of, before you even start Googling and, and start your research, um, is really ask yourself, what do you need for appliances? What are the features that are important to you? Are there features that are must-haves for you personally and will help your life or that you've wanted? Um, and then work backwards, because once you go down that Googleable world or into a showroom where maybe they have different al alternative motives to sell you what they want, um, it can get really overwhelming. So just understanding what you need um, and then sit with the store and really we start with that, just that download of what are you looking for? What's important to you? When's the timing of the project? And understanding to be open to maybe some new suggestions because supply chain is fractured. All the while, I think you can do that and get exactly what you want, um, as long as you know that it's a good up, upfront company that's that's looking out for your best interest. Just keep an open mind, but understand again what you really want, so you don't feel like you're being pressured or sold into features you may or may not. That would be my. Recommendation. I have a different kind of tact on that. Um, it really depends what we're talking about. First, the first question: Can you get a suite of appliances um, in this day and age? Um, and 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 I like going with the suite only because you're matching, you're matching, especially on the commodity stuff, on the, on the super premium side, and you're paneling, it doesn't matter anyway. But I, I like matching the style. And again, you know, lighting conditions in your kitchen are different. So even if it is a little different, no one's gonna know. But I like matching the, 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 the tile handles and you do get rebates and it is kind of like in your semi best interest to do um, to a point. Um, but absent of that, I think what Dennis is talking about too is, is uh, look for things that don't have a style, like pocket handles. We talked 
you know, we talked before the thing about appliances with no handles, like pocket handles. Dennis is like a pocket handle king, you know, because we know that you're not going to be able to get a suite of anything. So if you get a pocket handle with something with no style to it, you can't possibly not match. Whereas you get like, you know, Hessian Range has got that fluted, you know, Saab use. It's got that big fluted towel bar, you know, you don't match that up. It kind of looks a little bit silly with other towel bars. So first question to me is, is whether you can get everything. And if you can, um, minimize the style as much. Yeah, we agree. Sweets, sweets, if they have them. In COVID, it's harder to get sweets. If you're all Yale customers, the good news is we have sweets where most yeah. dealers, but, but if you, uh, some of you are out of market and most of our competitors don't all own their own warehousing. So I'm going to tell you, they're not going to be able to get your sweets, you know? So we can go both ways, but it changes by the day. Yeah. And I do love pocket handles. They, they, they just solve a lot of problems. Let's pivot to laundry. A couple of questions uh, came in about laundry is um, Dennis here. Is, is an agitator or impeller better? So that's yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm assuming this question is not front load related. This is probably asking about top load related because that's the only type of laundry today that has an agitator, the style that most of us grew up with where you lift the lid. Um, you know, Yale takes a pretty strong stance on the non-agitator models. Um, frankly, they don't wash well. They, they just don't, you know, you know, to wash laundry, you need to turn, you need friction. You need clothes to rub up against clothes. And you need that, that movement effect so that the water comes in and out of the fabric. And, and with the non-agitator models, we've actually tested this with video cameras through a whole cycle before. Simply put, the water does not pass through the clothes often enough. Um, so while they're large and Americans want big, I mean, we, we buy with our eyes, bigger is better in our mind a lot of times. At the end of the day, you want clean clothes, I would imagine. So. You know, uh, to that end, we, we, we would probably always try, we try to push the agitator model today. I will tell you there's some brands and, and they just pushed back the launch. We will be doing a test on it. I just got notice from Whirlpool Corp is actually trying a new, what they call a two-in-one washer, where this has an agitator as a classic machine would, but can also be removed. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. If you found like you wanted to put something bigger in there, I don't, I don't know. We're going to find out if it's the best of both worlds. I guess I'll tell you. Stay tuned. We're going to test it and Steve will blog about it. But that's it. That's an interesting concept to me. You know, uh, certainly re removes buyer's remorse. You know, if, if, if you didn't like one type versus the other, you have the best of both worlds, perhaps. We'll tell you for sure if it is. <laughs> uh, one more on laundry and then we'll... And then Saab, I'll bring you in here. Uh, Dennis, um, best front load washing machine um, for the for a home and, and I'm in a wheelchair. So like what accessibility considered there? What, what, what do we recommend? Yeah, so ADA, ADA you have a bunch of options. Um, assuming it's full size, there's ADA compact laundry, which is only 24 by 24 and generally is, is, is shorter in height. So it may not be the easiest solution, but sometimes does fit under counters in kitchen. So I don't know the particular application, but a full size ADA, you have Samsung, you have GE. Um, there's a few different options. You know, I'll tell you, I would probably at that case lean towards a GE for the simple fact that across their 65 and 85 models, um, pretty easy to use interface, big wide open tubs, um, so easier to access the actual port of the, of the machine. Um, they do have kind of a cool Wi-Fi feature, which, um, you know, again, just, just the, the, the comment about um, the wheelchair, I'm just maybe perhaps a little easier to get around with. You can actually start and stop the machine from your, from your iPhone. You can see how much time is left remaining. So it may just save you some trips to the washer machine that may be a little trickier to get to, not knowing the layout. Um, but, you know, on top of all of that, it just happens to be a good set of laundry. We sell a lot of it in the, in the general right now. So as long as you stay to the 65 and the 85 series GEs, I think that'll be my recommendation. Samsung is in there, but you're not going to get Samsung. Simply put, no ETA. Honestly, feature pack is kind of very basic. GE has a lot, and we've talked about it in other blogs, has a lot of great features. So I think it's probably the more cutting edge option. Yeah, you also get the auto dispenser in those too. So you don't have to fill it each time. 
because you want it easy. I think Wi-Fi, and it's funny, we talk about smart and everyone focuses on cooking, but smart for laundry is, 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 is probably the best category that we've seen. And, yeah. and if you're in a wheelchair, you want the upfront control, so you're going to front load. I would put Neil in there because, you know, their interface is very intuitive. Um, you know, you've got the, um, it, it pretty much tells you everything. Um, it gives you an auto dispenser. It gives you, if you like, the, uh, the pods. It's got a, uh, it's got a pod dispenser on it. Um, you know, and a whole bunch of different features that might make it convenient and easier. Switch it up to cooking, Saba, um, in a multi-purpose oven, like an advanced EM or speed oven, maybe include steam ovens too, um, actually replace other appliances in the kitchen. Um, I'm just pop uh, opening the question. Can a multi-purpose oven advantium actually replace? Okay, so it uh, depends on how uh, you cook. A lot of people do like larger ovens for holidays uh, to roast the 25 pound turkeys and large rib roasts. Those will not um, be able to fit in an advantium or in a speed oven. So um, a lot of times those are specialty ovens that are add-ons um, in your kitchen renovation or kitchen upgrades. So um, it really comes down to your cooking style and what it is you produce in your kitchen. So um, if you don't cook a lot for the holidays or if you cook smaller things, I would say um, the speed oven would be a little bit more versatile than the Advantium because you do have full convection capability. So you would be able to make a small chicken or a small roast and still bake your pie. Um, the Advantium does have some uh, convection cooking options where you can definitely cook, um, you know, uh, proteins, but uh, there are limitations with it. So definitely comes down to personal cooking style and the variety of uh, food and um, I would say the size of the meals. Great, thank you. We'll switch it up to uh, get a couple of questions on ventilation about recirculating. Um, Dennis, maybe you want to take this one. Um, you know, now, if, you're, if you're unable to vent outdoors, yeah. uh, recirculating is an option. What would yeah. we get that a lot option? in terms of what's the best recirculating good? Um, that's actually an impossible answer. Um, there is no such thing as a better recirculating good in terms of performance. Recirculating is recirculating. Um, the, the only key to help recirculate would be to change the carbon filters in the hood, which 99% of the time do not get installed because contractors throw them out and they do not think they're actually a part you need. They see the metal baffle or the little uh, you know, metal uh, insert that's there for the hood and they do not realize that there is some type of a carbon filtration system to every recirculating hood that needs to be installed in addition. So they, they put in the metal and they throw out the carbon and you're not doing anything. That's one. Two of the main decisions there are really lighting and aesthetic. I mean, it's form, form there. You're really looking into what it looks like because that's the really only difference here. Do you want a chimney hood? Do you want one under the counter? And pay attention to lighting. What is the lighting like? Is it dimmable? Is it, does it match well with what you're doing for under cabinet lighting in the kitchen? And that's probably fit and finish of, of the edges of the hood, little things like that. That's your only choice. Better than nothing. Maybe. Yeah. See how excited we are about recirculating? No, we're just kidding. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, that's what it is. You're not releasing heat. Um, you're running it through charcoal filter. I guess that is better than nothing, but not by no means on. Yeah. And then uh, we had a couple of questions on ovens, specifically about French door or side swing ovens. Um, what are the drawbacks uh, and what are our comments in general? Well, in terms of utilities, I think Saba would be best talking about that. She's worked with Gaginal and the um, Blue Star and the Jeep. I, I, I think. Um, when you talk about specialty products, I mean, Gaggin is 10,000, that's, that's a separate category, but I think what you're talking about is when you go with French door side swing, it's a little bit easier because you're inside the oven and Saba can talk about that. I think in terms of features, you know, Wolf with their gourmet and, and, and Milo with their master chef and even Jen Air with their cuisine center, those are fold down. So you're not gonna get those automated features um, that are actually kind of good. Um, in a French door oven. But in terms of using it, what do you think, Salma? 
Yeah, I would say um, a lot of it comes down to uh, your interface or how you interact with the oven. Having the side swing or the French door will give you the ability to get up close to the oven. You don't have to reach over the door. So um, it is more ergonomic and user friendly in that respect. Um, so I, I do like that style, but it is limited to certain brands. Uh, so like Steve said, you wouldn't be able to get all those um, guided cooking programs in, um, in necessarily those style of ovens. Uh, so I would say definitely if you prefer to get, be able to get closer to the oven, if you roast a lot of uh, big, heavy uh, meats, then being able to get close access to the oven uh, makes a lot of sense. And um, also of course, it, it's an aesthetic and design element as well. So taking all those factors into consideration um, would make that a great choice, but otherwise a traditional oven, you can still do all of that same stuff, but there is obviously the oven door that you have to work around. Great, thank you. Um, let's switch back to laundry. We had a question about the uh, LG wash tower. Uh, it's a, a product we talked about during the presentation. Does it, does it come with a vented, gra vented gas dryer option? Is there a steam function included there? The answer to that is yes, it does come gas vented and there is a steam steam uh, version. They have a 1000 and a 2000 series oven and um, steam is available in both. Um, you know, that unit, we like it. Understand that that control panel is, is unique that it's in the middle. Um, I suppose if you have an issue with the control panel, you have a an issue with both units, the washer and the dryer, but there's one interface. Um, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of a concept. It's not new. That concept has been out there. There used to be a brand that had a move uh, interchangeable. It was LG actually years and years ago. LG had the interchangeable. Yeah, it didn't take off so well. The brands that have that all-in-one, lower stacked uh, control panel would be Speed Queen. Does today? It's another brand that has it, and um, and and this LG. We, we have a video on the, on the wash tower where we do a deep dive on all well, its features and all it's, it's a pretty likable product, quite honestly, because um, you're not stacking one on top of another and it does give you good features, so. Yeah, the, the consideration, although it just, they just made a change to the design is the, uh, the delivery of the unit, you know, paying attention to, for the first gen, it was all a one piece unitized unit. So delivery was, could be challenging depending on the curves of the home, getting it in and out. Now, more recently, there are a couple of brackets you can remove in the back. You just want to make sure whoever's delivering and doing that knows what they're doing to disassemble them and put them back together. Uh, it can be done, but it should be done by someone that is familiar. We have about five minutes left. We'll get through as many of these questions as we can here, and then we'll make sure to follow up with anything that's left over. Um, back to ventilation. Um, we're deciding between an inline and internal blower blower to vent. Uh, if the inline were to break, how do you access that and fix it? <laughs> Depends where you put it. <laughs> yes, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a million dollar question. Yeah, we see that think, a lot. People put them in, they're great hoods, but then you can't access them. So some people put them up in an attic and they're just, they're just hanging from a rafter and they're free in an attic and it's easy to access. Some people that put them, design a home and put them between floors, first and second floor, second and third, depending on the home. Um, you need a real access. Someone needs to be able to basically picture. They need to get up there and sit in there with the unit and, and, and handle it. So it's a great concept. It's just it, that that's the most important part, designing how do you access it after the fact. You need to. And one more about ventilation. Would you recommend a 27-inch hood, even if your range is 24 inches deep? Um, depends how you cook, and it depends how tall you are. Right, because you know, if you're really tall, you're gonna hit your head on the hood. Um, if you're doing a lot of high volume cooking, the answer to that question is, you know, you go into Saba's world where they're cooking a lot. You want something as deep and as wide. You know, it's a you know, hood in a restaurant is basically the kitchen in the middle, right? So that's the answer. But if, if you're, I think over what's the, what's the height threshold? Is it six feet, six foot one, whatever? You can hit your head on. So you gotta stand back.
couple more here. Uh, reliability is always a big, um, a big topic. Should you avoid a refrigerator with an external water dispenser? You know what? Questions. Um, you know, when you put a frozen cube through a warm refrigerator, you now get leaky. Um, the bad news is that it's uh, it's almost a design flaw. The good news is you still have your refrigerator, right? You can still get any ice. So in terms of it is the number one service problem of our, our company, that and stove igniters and gas. But it, at the end of the day, um, you can still, you know, the refrigerator, you're not going to lose a, a refrigerator's worth of food. Um, so I, I guess from that standpoint, I, I just don't know a lot of refrigerators that don't have ice cream. Quite honestly, I you know Becco does, and Genie does maybe. Yeah, so, like a couple of things there. When you put ice, ice and water in the door, it magnifies the, the problem uh, because now there's a lot more that has to happen. You're generally keeping, um, you know, it just has to work down through the machine. It's plastic grinding. So if, if there's an ice maker in the unit, we see less, we still see service, but less service than in the door, which leads us into the next question that, that I know this gentleman, Scott, has asked that I have to answer, which was, you know, ice makers in general freestanding ice makers. Um, you know, a couple of the yield salespeople had mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, that they, they can have issues. They do have issues. We would be lying. Ice in general is, to Steve's point, our most common service call. Um, where are you getting that from is people do not, two things, they do not maintain and clean the unit frequently. People will say they do, but we generally on most calls, that's, that's issue one. Issue two is if you're going to do it I really highly recommend you do a pump machine. They're slightly more expensive, but if put in a pump because it pushes the water out and God forbid you ever did have a leak, it stops the water from coming back in or the unit shut down. So pump machines because gravity, the other style is what's called, there's two, three styles. Condensation, which is what you had asked in that question, Scott, about a crescent cube. A condensation crescent cube historically People will recommend because there's, there's less service with it, but there's also less ice production. And the complaint you get a lot of times is they're a wet, sweaty cube. The cube, the water is not propelled anywhere. It's just self-contained. So that's condensation. The second one would be gravity fed, which is just that. We're hoping that all your piping, the water naturally drips out and falls its, its, its path out, outside of the home to a drain. I will tell you, we highly recommend against gravity fed somewhere in the home. There's a blip in that drain and we have issues water and you don't want it. So that's why we would push you to a pump machine. Absolutely. If you're buying from us, we do have an actual preventative cleaning, uh, uh, routine maintenance that we can do through our service department that you can sign up for that we will come and clean your machine for you correctly. But I would still be lying to say that it guarantees that it won't, will not break. You still have all the things Steve talked about, you know, plastic, water dropping, all the rest. So that's kind of our, our over, overview of ice makers. They tend to be this. They're an expensive item. Someone, it's emotional. People that ask that really like ice. And when they break, they remember how much they spent on this whole kitchen and these darn ice makers driving them nuts. And now, you know, that's probably the thing you enjoy the most. Maybe that drink of water or cocktail or whatever you drink. So we just want to set the right expectation of it. It's not an issue without its flaws and without routine, consistent maintenance. Yeah, I mean, segue, I think if you clean it, you're going to be okay. But, you know, people aren't cleaning it two, three times a year. And it's kind of a shame because ice cubes are like the new thing. You know, you got the craft cube, which is like, if you like scotch, it's a slow dissolving cube. You've got the sonic, you know, the sonic slushy cube, you know, for your, you know, lemonades and everything in the summer. You know, crushing shapes, cube shapes. I mean, you can you can almost customize an ice cube now based on what you drink. But the thing is, without cleaning it and 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 without using a pump, you're really asking for it. Quite honestly, don't buy it if you don't want to clean it. Correct, really. Yeah, sure. a potential solution is that is well, very unique. And and the cube is an honest thing. If if you're into drinking. Um, and you want something to hold the hold it longer than it's a barrel cube. And a barrel cube is really three brands. Yale has a proprietary ice maker now that has a barrel cube, True, the brand True, and Sub-Zero. Those are the three barrel cubes. 
Marvell and Uline really one and the same company in many ways. More often than not, their cubes are a small dice, which dissolves very quickly in drinks and is not the best for icing down a cooler. Um, something you're gonna drink quickly. Then you, after that, have the Crescent Cubes, which we talked about, which is more in the condensation machine. Steve did mention this Sonic Ice, and now GE makes a countertop model that we're actually stocking because it is a thing. It's the Rage is Ice. It's mm. called Opal Ice Maker. It's a countertop unit. It has its own filter system. It's self-contained. You can plug in. You could take it on a trip. It's small. It's pretty good looking. Um, but that is another solution. And I guess this way there, listen, it's on your counter. You know, cost-wise, you're probably talking around $600 but it's not the $3,000 average for an ice maker in general. So could be a solution. You can get the, the LG has got, um, they've got the craft ice, which is like almost like what a, a baseball. I mean, tennis ball, no, smaller than that. But you get the idea of like the spherical cube and they have in some of their uh, counter depth refrigerators, two different ice makers. Um, but I guess it only makes like four ice cubes per 24 hours or something like that. Yeah, three. You know, we, we can't get them because I thought it was pretty interesting. But when, when they become available, hopefully, um, it's certainly another alternative. All right, we're past the hour. I think we'll wrap up there. We have uh, a few questions we will follow up on over the next day or so. Um, like we said at the beginning, we will share this presentation via email. You'll have a recording in your inbox. Um, it, will, it will also be on YouTube uh, over the next few days. Um, Steve mentioned all of our pre previous webinars are on our YouTube channel and that new Appliance 101 series is on YouTube as well as uh, as a podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We're still releasing episodes weekly. Um, when you do get that email, feel free to send over any questions we could follow up on and uh, we'll be sure to send out the next webinar details when we get closer to that. So uh, thank you for Thank you for attending and we'll see you soon. Thanks.